Amen. Stay with me. Stay with me. Can we just stay in an attitude of worship? I just, I don't want to move from that moment right now. I think that um, one of the distinctives to understand about the Holy Spirit is that he's a person. He's not an influence. He's not an it. He's not snot bubbles and tears. He's not goosebumps. He's a person. Say amen. In John 14 and in John 16, you see that Jesus uses the personal pronoun he to ascribe to, to the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, you'll find that all the attributes given to both the Father and the Son are also given to the Holy Spirit. If you go through the rest of the New Testament, you'll see in Ephesians and in different areas that he can be insulted, he can be grieved. And so he has a personality, do you believe that? Say yes. And I just want us to be so discerning of his personality in the room tonight. So discerning. We need the Holy Spirit. We learned in Sunday school that Jesus Christ was in our heart. And it's just not true. He's in heaven. He makes his home in our heart through Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. When Jesus resurrected, he is confined to a locale. Right? They only see him at certain moments. But the one who is omnipresent, that is everywhere at all times in this room right now, is Holy Spirit. He is what we need to come inside of us and upon us. He's in us for us. He comes upon us for others. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you to be what my witness is. So Holy Spirit, we need you upon this service. For the neighbor sitting next to us, we need you on me, Holy Spirit. Speak to us through the feeble attempt of communication. We need the Holy Spirit in us. It's the fruits of the Spirit that he produces. The, the theological word regeneration or sanctification. In other words, God forming us. We begin to discuss that. That is, happens through the Holy Spirit. He is the initiator, the perfecter, and the one who brings that about. Do you believe that? Say yes. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and do what only you can do in this room. We ask you to move in a way that only you can move in this room. Is there someone who walked in here and your hip is hurting you? Your left hip. I see the hand went shot up right away. Is that pastor? Your left hip's hurting you? Can you just stand, pastor? Will you just stretch your hands towards him while you're sitting there? I don't know all the situations. God, I pray over Pastor Weaver's left hip, God. I pray for supernatural healing. I would command that hip to come into alignment with the word of God that by your stripes he is healed. God, I pray for no for all the pain to decease, to be mitigated. I pray for, for mobility to come back. God, I pray that it would it would it would dissipate right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we ask you to perform your wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How's it feel? Literally better? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's scary when you pray over the pastor, and if he doesn't get healed, you might be a fraud, right? I'm <laughs> just kidding. It's Holy Spirit does miracles, not me. I was once preaching a crusade in Africa, and uh, we were going to the slums, and the African pastor looked at me, and he said, if there's no miracles tomorrow, you can get on the first plane back to America. <laughs> I was like, you know, a little bit of an arrogant 20-year-old from the hood. So I looked at him like, yo, listen to this, man. I don't perform miracles. Jesus does. And I just, and he just looked at me and he said, good, we should have no problems. <laughs> he just keeps eating his food. And uh, the next day, I was scared out of my mind. I thought I was going to catch the first flight back to America. I'm like, God, please perform miracles. And a club foot just went poof right in front of me. And I just started, and miracles started. And I, then I saw this other lady start screaming. She started hearing out of her right uh, ear for the first time in a really long time. How many of you have an ailment in your body? Just raise your hand. You walked in with an ailment in your body. Man, that is half the room. Can you stand to your feet? Now, because I believe the Holy Spirit dwells in each and every one of us, and I don't believe that it's contingent on me praying for any one individual in this place, that's why I'm going to ask those of you who are sitting around, would you just extend your hands to them? 
And I just want you, so one person lead. Here's what happens in Romans chapter 14. says that God is a God of order. He's not the author of confusion. So what I don't want to happen is five people are praying distinctively different prayers. I want one person to lead. The rest of you in concert intercede with the one leading. So I'm going to get off the microphone. I'm going to go pray for a couple of you. Tell us where you're hurting. Don't make us be that prophetic. And we're going to pray over you. All right? I'm going to come off here. Let's just start praying. Start praying for the mass. Then what's going on? Healing, Lord, healing, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I want you to kind of, what if, if you're able to kind of test what was hurting you, maybe there was pain and, or whatever have you, can you do something that you weren't able to do before and tell me how, how that body part is feeling? Some things we can't uh, investigate until after the service, obviously. But if you can just do that, will you do that for me? How many of you feel healing already right now? Whatever they just prayed for feels better right here. What happened? Your back was healed. So you had pain before you walked in here? No pain right now? You look shocked. Amen. I'm shocked too. Every time. God is good. Anybody else? You can, you can kind of move, do something that you weren't able to do before. A pain has been released. Uh, Steve, I was praying for, he said tingling in his legs for the first time. Yes, ma'am. It's gone. The pain's gone. Come on, Jesus. Amen. 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 Do you love Jesus? Amen. God, we give you this service. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. God, I give you my tongue. I pray that you'd make it like a pen of a ready writer. Give us discernment on what you're doing tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Everybody said? Amen. Thank you, sir. Mr. Isaac, the prophetic preacher. I know he's on keys, but he's a prophetic preacher. Amen? You know, if you look in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, you'll find in chapter 12 that uh, Paul begins to describe the personal gifts of the Spirit and the, the gifts that we will get personally. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, he will kind of sandwich it, which we all call the love chapter. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, he kind of gives the corporate gifts and kind of a governance on how they're supposed to work in a setting like this in a corporate set of believers. I want to kind of camp out in 1 Corinthians 13. It's been the musing of people who do poetry. Uh, Nicholas Sparks acts like he owns the corner on 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient, love is kind. And let's create a rom-com out of it or something. Uh, but it's, it's the Bible, amen? You come to the end of that chapter, it's so important that it's in the middle of, of both of these chapters because you have the personal gifts of the Spirit, the corporate gifts of the Spirit, and sandwiched in there is kind of the fruit of the Spirit. And it says this at the end of verse 13, it says, And these three will remain, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. And these three will remain, faith, say hope. 
and love. I want to speak about hope tonight. I, I, I think it's sometimes, how many of you are the oldest in your family? Raise your hand. We are all kin. Our parents made all our mistakes on us, right? Say amen. Life was harder for us. Say amen. The oldest, we had it rough. Our parents made all the mistakes on us. I got spanked 50 times more than my second brother and 100,000 times more than my third brother. And I was raised with a BMW. That means she a big Mexican woman. And when she hits you, it hurts and it's really hard. Say amen. I can say that because I'm Mexican. Say okay. <laughs> I just love to make it feel a little awkward sometimes. But she really was a BMW. My wife is my wife. My mom. <laughs> my mom has lost a hundred pounds. She was legit a big Mexican woman who could make tortillas and smack you with an extension cord at the same time. It was it was dangerous. But my youngest brother's like never gets spanked ever. I'm like, what's up with that? Time out? I didn't know anything about time out. It was corpor corporal punishment every time. Every time. How many of you are the baby? I can't stand you, you spoiled. <laughs> spoiled. Rotten. You're the favorite. I can't with you. How many of you are the middle child? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we just clap for the middle child? There's no pictures of you. We almost missed your graduation. When you had kids, grandma and grandpa hardly cared. They bought the crib and the stroller for the first child's grandkid, but for your kid, I think you got diapers, right? <laughs> I mean, the middle child. Usually the middle child is the forgotten child. And I just feel like hope is the middle forgotten child between faith and love. I think faith and love get the fanfare of, of, of our walk with God. Faith, we, we know that it's impossible to please God without faith, right? Hebrews eleven six. 6, for this is faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We all want to please God. We have to have faith. We understand love. Even the world will accept a notion of love or at least their conceptual idea of love which usually lacks teeth in its application but everyone kind of understands love say love but hope is this thing that I think is hard to define and differentiate between faith and what is hope in the midst of all this but God mentions them in concert with each other for a reason faith hope and love these three will remain faith hope say hope in love. So if you're taking notes tonight, and remember, if you're taking notes, you're 10 times more likely to go to heaven. By this time, it's Tuesday night, you're, you're 20 times more likely to go to heaven if you're still taking notes. But the choice is yours. The title of tonight's sermon is The Middle Child. The Middle Child. The Middle Child. The Forgotten Middle Child of Hope. The Forgotten Middle Child of Hope. You can tell when someone has lacked hope because you hear it in their language. Right? Luke 6.35, out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. We can tell when there's an, a person that is hopeless because their language begins to change. You can tell when you're around a hopeful person because out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. There's, there's a hopeful sound to the cadence in which they speak. Does that make sense? Say yes. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Hope. I want to talk about hope tonight and it's hard right like we i think if we're all sober minded you can sit around and think what is hopeful about this moment in fact if you take a quick cursory look at the current generation coming up they're the most anxious and depressed generation of all time that's empirical data uh, the um, suicide rates are on on the rise and it's not just young people you can see that our nation is becoming hopeless we don't even know how to have conversations that are civil. We have Facebook posts with no dialogue. We have come and camped out into echo chambers of opinion and think this is just the way it is and we put our hands up and we're hopeless. Two things about hope. Hope, number one, develops you. Hope develops you. The second thing is hope doesn't disappoint. 
Hope develops you and hope doesn't disappoint. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 21 through 25, Paul begins to write, and, remind, and think about this, he's, he's writing about hope from a prison cell knowing he's looking at an, an, uh, an, an, an he's, death, like he's not going to get away from it. Sorry, the adjective that I was looking for somehow evaded my mind. But the death is imminent. He is going to die. He knows this. He's writing this from a Roman prison cell, and he's talking about hope. He's talking about hope. So in Romans chapter 8, verses 21 through 25, Paul begins to pen these words. He says, the creation looks forward or against its will, sorry, verse 20, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, say hope, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope, say hope, for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised to us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Hope develops you. Uh, a couple things happened when my wife became pregnant. It says that creation waits uh, like a pregnant woman in, 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 in child pains and births. Sons and daughters, we, you, you, it's, this, it's this almost unexplainable groaning. We know that something's not right and we're waiting for God to make it all right. The renewal of all things. There's this innate desire inside of us for that to happen. And when my wife became pregnant, it was this weird moment. Some of you love pregnancy. I think it's completely weird. There is a being growing inside my wife's womb. And she would always ask me to talk to the stomach. I'm like, I can't, this is weird. Some of you are like, you are a shallow human being. <laughs> that was your son incubating in there. And I'm like, I don't know what it was. I just, I was like, I, I felt like I was talking to her tummy and I wasn't like, I was like, I, I don't know. And it was, it was really, really weird for me. And then her stomach would begin to move as like, and I'm like, yeah, that, that, that's like a horror film. I don't, I don't want, she's like, touch it. Baby, he's kicking, he's kicking. And I'm like, no, ah, like, I, I don't know what it is. It just kind of like weirded me out a whole lot. And, and things begin to change. And my wife is one of those, those ladies, like if you're looking at her from the front, you, you can't tell that she's pregnant. And then all of a sudden she turns to the side, she's like, and just knocking things over in the grocery store. She's forgetting things. She's becoming clumsy. She's super fatigued in the first trimester. She like can't even get out of bed. I'm like, what is the matter with you? And this baby is growing on the inside. And then you get towards the third trimester and she's like, I'm done. I'm done. My feet hurt. I'm tired. My hips hurt. Everything hurts, Gabriel. And I'm like, and you start getting scared as a husband. You walk around in your house with trepidation. You're like, well, 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 what can I do to serve you? I'm like, I'll lift everything. I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to do. I'm like, you, you're the one going this way. And she can't sleep all night, so she's, she's getting like senile. She's, she's getting up all through the night to pee like 50,000 times. That's, that's inhuman. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, do you not, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's happening to your bladder? Like, well, I don't understand. And she's, she has to go, to, the, to, to go pee all through the night. And then when we got to birth in that moment, I was like, I, I've never seen none of my kids birth. I looked at the wall. I don't need to know what's happening over here. I hold a leg and I stare at the wall. I got a leg and I got the wall. You good, baby? I'm good. And in and, and the, the midwife's telling my wife to breathe, she's like, breathe. And, and I'm breathing more than her. And she's like, push. And I'm like, 
and I'm, because I'm, I am like losing my mind. It is unbelievably scary. And, but right before she gets to birth, all this begins to happen so quickly. My wife is like so frustrated. She's like, I just want this baby out. And she went through a summer pregnant and where I'm like, she's, she's hot. She's like, I can't, I'm having hot flashes. And she's up through the middle of the night and right before the birth. And what ends up happening is that a woman's body begins to go through this transformation as this miracle is developing in her. And at, when, the, when we get closer to the time of birth and she can't sleep through the night, what I didn't realize is her body was not only being developed to carry a miracle, but to ultimately care for a miracle. She became acclimated to being up through the middle of the night because soon there would be a child that needed to be nursed throughout the night. She was used to an eclectic sleep pattern that had already been developing in her before the child was actually here. And hope sometimes has a way of developing you to be able to walk and operate in an environment that your miracle is in. And if you don't develop in this season, you'll never be able to walk in the miracle of the next season. Hope develops you. There are things growing on the inside of you. There are things growing on the outside of you. And if you don't develop in this season, through the pain of that growth, that miracle, the hips beginning to separate. And what I realized very clearly is it's always the most painful right before the birth. It's always, I don't know anything about that. I hold a leg and look at the wall, but it is most painful always right before the birth. It is when she is at her wit's end and she can sleep only to realize later, I was not acclimated to those sleep patterns, but she was. And there is something that's happening in you right now that God is developing for the next season because growth is not always seen, but it's measured. Let me explain. I never saw my wife's belly grow, but we would go to the, to the, to the doctor every month and we would measure it and we would find out that baby has grown. Your belly has grown because growth happens so incrementally, so slowly that I act, actually can't see it, but I can measure it. When I take my kids to the pediatrician, I've never seen them grow, but we put them up against that thing and look at by God, they grew two inches. But I never saw it, but I was able to measure it. And there are things happening in you right now, trials and that you're going through that are about to knock you out right now, but you'll get into the next season and realize that you were developed in the same trial that would have knocked you out now. You just walk right through it with peace and joy. You walk right through it with the anchor of hope that is Jesus himself because growth is not always measured, is not always seen, but it is measured. Why do you think that some of you gray hairs in here can look at us young people and say, life ain't that hard, you're just being soft? Because you've already grown through where we are. You've already measured growth and we're unable to see it. But we need your gray hairs to tell us it's going to be okay. We don't need to hear from you that we're weak and that we're soft. We need to hear from you there's a God who's faithful. There's a God who's not going to give up on you. There's, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to stand with you. Yes, you live in a complicated world. It seems weird to me. I don't understand it. But here's me telling you that hope is developing you, young man, young woman. And then we become an intergenerational movement. Say amen. Growth is not always seen, but it is measured, but it is measured. There, there is something growing. We cannot, you, there are some things you're not ready for. Where some of us, some of young people, I deal with young people a lot, and they're like, I just don't know which college I'm going to go to. And you'll know when you need to, and not a moment soon, sooner. He's developing something in the waiting. Why, why have I not seen this come to pass? Because it's not time yet for it to come to pass. Any good parent knows, no matter how much a child asks for something, there are some things they're just not ready for. You cannot give the keys to a six foot 12 year old. I don't care that he's six foot tall and can dunk a basketball or whatever he's matured quickly physically but he's not ready emotionally he needs to develop hope develops you it anchors you in a place that allows with eager expectations for something to be mended into you to be mended out of you hope develops you do you believe that say yes do you believe that say yes hope develops us in romans 12 12 says this rejoice in our confident hope 
Be patient in trouble and keep on praying and keep on praying. Listen, this is what I know about hopeful people. They're a praying people. And this is what I know about praying people. Hard times don't last, but praying people do. Hard time, listen, hard times don't last, but tough people do. You ain't tough enough to make it in life without a supernatural provision from God, and that comes in the place of prayer. Amen? We wait in our confident hope, in our confident hope, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I am, I am, it's so dangerous to be gifted. It's so dangerous to have a lot of talents because many times a gift will get you to a place, but only character keeps you there. And we talked about this last night. God's primary interest in our lives is not what we're doing, but who we're becoming. And God is not just interested in doing miracles uh, uh, through you as he is so much as presenting you as a miracle to the world. He's developing you. He's developing me. Hope develops you. He's growing something. It's so interesting, and some of us who have walked with the Lord, even if you've only walked with the Lord for a year or a few months, link back right now as I'm speaking those moments. This season would have threw me for a loop, but here I am walking with God, rejoicing in a time of trouble. One of the most distinct characteristics of a mature believer is they rejoice in trials. It's the command of scripture, yet so many of us are able to get there because we haven't allowed hope to develop us to that point. It is, it is almost out of this world because I really do believe it is out of this world, right? As a believer, we're seated in heavenly places. We're literally just having an earthly experience, Philippians chapter two, verse six. And so, I, 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 it's, and you get around certain believers and there's just this rejoicing in the middle of trials. Pastor Hill said late, earlier, the, 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 the lady who oversaw uh, Operation Christmas Child, she said, hit the mark. And she was so excited to go see Jesus, rejoicing in a trial, looking at imminent death. That is someone who has allowed hope to develop her. Because hope is developing us. Do you believe that? Say yes. Hope is developing us from the inside out. It has to grow. And, and, and if some things are birthed before it's time, they cannot survive in the next season. You have to allow that baby to incubate. You have to allow that baby to grow. They've got to come to the place where they can breathe on their own. And then birth is ready. But hope is developing on the inside of you, growing like a baby until it's time to actually be birthed. And God develops us as people as a corporate movement what is the distinctive about Israel throughout the Old Testament that keeps them anchored in a God who seemingly has abandoned them hope it's hope how do you stay faithful to the festivals and your tradition and your God in 400 years of slavery because they know that these kingdoms can come in like the tide of the ocean. They're gonna roll out, but God will remain, but God will keep us, but God is developing us. He's, we are his distinct people. It is the thing that's kept them still to this day. Hope, hope, hope develops us. The second thing is hope doesn't disappoint. Hope doesn't disappoint. Go to Romans chapter four, verses 18, and then Romans five, three through five. Romans four, verses 18 says, even when there was no reason for hope, that's very uh, assuring right there. Wouldn't you love that? So let's just stop right there. Even when there was no reason for hope. You ever been in a situation where there's no reason for hope? Even when there was no reason for hope, Gosh, that sounds like America. Even when there was no reason for hope, it sounds like some of our family members. Even when there was no reason for hope, that sounds like that boss that we all can't stand say amen. You're gonna pray for him, but we, 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 we don't know if there's hope for him. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. That is crazy, you can just preach that all day, right? Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping 
believing that he would become the father of many nations, for God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you'll have. Romans chapter five, verses three through five, just shoot down a couple verses. It says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens, so he's developing our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Hope doesn't disappoint. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's giving us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And we know that this hope will not lead to disappointment. And we know that this hope will not lead to disappointment. I'm the oldest brother of two brothers. There's a couple privileges that come with being the oldest. Number one, I punk them every day for the whole of my life. Let me translate that for you. Some of that was an urban euphemism. I owned them. I beat them up. I beat them in every sport, every day. Say every day. My brother tried to fight me. That's a bad proposition, bro. And we didn't fight like youth nowadays fight. They get mad at each other and they run to the room and get on Snapchat and Instagram. My family's so unreasonable. I just can't stand them, call their friend. My brother's such a jerk. No, no, no. When we fought, it was knuckle up, looking at my brother, and it's, I mean, we're drawing blood. Say amen. I mean, I beat this kid. My, my, I have a brother who is two years younger than me, and then actually a brother that was born 17 years younger than me, so he kind of doesn't count. He was like, I don't know if he was oopsie. I don't know what happened there. That was just way later. And so well, I almost feel more like his uncle, honestly, than his brother because I was already 17 when he was born. But Matthew, I grew up with. I would beat this kid at everything. We would get signed up for football. We'd put on our football pads and we'd do side angle tackle drills in the front yard before season ever starts. And I'd beat this kid. I mean, I'll put his face in the dirt. Amen. I mean, I was, we'd go play pickup basketball outside and I'm like, and, and I may be sure, but I got a pretty quick little fast dribble and a decent shot. And I'd beat him every time. Say every time. We'd play video games. I win every time. Say every time. I mean, we, I mean, this kid, I owned this kid. He has little brother syndrome bad. I was just like, what, Matthew? Sorry, bro, why are you gonna get all crazy? <laughs> and this, this interesting thing happened, though, that, you know, I'm 5'6 I'm and Mexican, which is the new sexy, at least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> and I, <laughs> so I'm like, my brother just keeps growing. And I'm like, that's not fair, God. I prayed. That's really not fair. And by the time he's a junior in high school, he's benching 350 pounds. He's squatting 500 pounds. He's a defensive tackle and can jump up and grab the rim. Somebody say, uh-oh. <laughs> and so we're at a burger joint in my hometown and Matthew starts getting in an argument with this guy. I'm at the car already. I don't even know that they're arguing. I look back like this. This guy's like a 20-year-old gangster dude, like tattoos. I don't know. He must have just got out of jail. But he wasn't a teenager. He didn't go to our high school or anything like that. So I'm, I'm 18. Matthew's 16. He's, he's a, so he'd be a sophomore. I was a senior. And, I'm, and I look back like this, and we're at this burger joint. I see my brother just, just kind of come back, and he's like, he's sitting there. And, my, and I'm looking at my brother, and he just goes, Phew. Boom, and he hits that dude with, with one, two, and I see that dude literally fold up like an accordion. Brrr, boom, and hit the ground. I was like, Shande. <laughs> Gloria de Dios. I mean, I, I legit was like, was that my brother? The kid I beat up all the time? The one that we just got in an argument two days ago and he was afraid to fight me? Is that the same kid? I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna, and, and so I just did what any man of God would do. I begin to walk him through forgiveness <laughs> against anybody and everybody that ever had hurt him or offended him. I said, Matthew, listen, listen, Matthew, you've got to forgive anybody that's ever beat you up. <laughs> anybody. I said, Mira, Mira, Matthew, Mira, you, <laughs> if anybody's ever shot you point blank with a BB gun, you have to forgive them. <laughs> I mean, you gotta forgive them, Matthew. And, and Matthew, and Matthew, listen, when you forgive someone, you're, you're, not, you're not saying what they did is okay. 
You're, you're not releasing them from what they, you're, you're not re releasing them from what they did. There may be consequences. You're just releasing yourself from what they did. You know, they shouldn't have that much power over you. I mean, I was giving him a, pres a theological prescription with application on how to forgive people. I just did what any man of God would do. So Matthew, you need to forgive everybody. Everybody that's ever punched you, everybody that's any shot you with a BB gun point blank, anyone that's ever just, you know, embarrassed you and walked into the shower and hit you with cold water in front of all your friends and just pulled back, you know, that one time, I'm so sorry. You need to forgive everybody because what I was willing to fight when he was younger, I didn't want to deal with when he was benching 350 pounds, squatting 500, because this is too pretty to get sandwiched backwards. Say amen. I mean, I'm not ready to deal with all that. I'm like, I'm way too, no, 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 no. I'm way too pretty for all that. I am not trying to fight this kid right now because what I was willing to deal with when he was younger, I didn't want any smoke from when he was older. And what the devil would love to deal with in infancy in your life he does not want to deal with in maturity he rather snuff out your hope right now because he knows the end game of this doesn't disappoint he would love to snuff out the global sea church right now in a moment of dire need because he knows at the end of all of this there's a God who's still faithful there's a God who doesn't disappoint and so why do you think that child development happens primarily by the time they're five years old because the devil would love to bring bring dysfunction, would love to bring uh, 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 hurts and pains and trauma and grief before that child ever gets older. So it is with our faith. The devil would love, why do you think you're being attacked so much right now? It's not because there's so much wrong with you, but because there's so much right in you. Do you why do you think this generation so attacked? Why is abortion rampant? Because every time the devil comes for the children, he's raising up deliverers in Moses. Every time he comes for children again he's raising up the deliverer in Jesus and I believe this nation when a demonic assignment has tried to come against the youth that are born and unborn because God knows that there is hope on this earth and it doesn't disappoint and I just believe that he's raising up deliverers he's raising up insurgents that are subversive to the culture and God is not done do you believe that say yes Hope doesn't disappoint. Even when there was no reason for hope, he kept on hoping for God said, for God said, he kept on hoping. He kept on hoping. In Romans, it says that, in Romans 15, it says that he gave the examples in the Old Testament for our benefit so that we can wait with confident hope. He gave examples for us to wait with confident hope hope every time you read through the bible you got to be he did it there he did it there he did it there he did it there he did it with them he did it with them which means he'll do it with me which means he'll do it with them which means he'll do it again amen and then we can wait with confident hope knowing that hope doesn't disappoint that hope doesn't disappoint i know you're tired but it's right before the miracle that hope is most tested. Hope's developing in you. And hope doesn't disappoint. It always brings the results in which it was intended to bring. The middle child, faith, hope, and love. What's going to change the world? Love. How are we going to do it? In faith. And right there in the middle is hope. If I could differentiate them, I would almost think of faith as uh, faith is, is almost like a belief in tomorrow. Love is like a belief in how we relate to each other, but hope is in the present that God is still with us. If I could say it again like this, faith is, is almost the, uh, the, the belief in God's ability and hope is a belief in his character. If I could differentiate between optimism and hope, it would be this. Optimism is hinged to human ability. Hope is hinged to Almighty God. This is not some 
psychological, what differentiates us between some uh, 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 group therapy is not that we're trying to navel gaze and self-diagnose ourselves and understand uh, uh, things well enough that we can now, uh, you know, interchange behavioral cognitive therapy. We're going to replace bad thoughts or good thoughts, bad thoughts with good thoughts, and, and that's helpful, but I'm just here to tell you that you relate, you re replace bad thoughts with scripture because you're dependent upon a, a power that is beyond yourself, and now you've transitioned from optimism to hope. From optimism to hope. In, in fact, in Jeremiah 17, it's, he says this, in Jeremiah 17, verse five through seven, he says, this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in barren wilderness in an uninhibited salty land. When we put our trust in just mere human ability, it's just optimism. We're trusting in ourselves, but hope is anchored to Jesus. I love when, when David pants in Psalms 37, I've been young and now I'm old and I have never, say never, seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Can I just press on you that some of you that have gray hair, I have five of them, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. I need, I need that from you. I need that because I got, I, got, I got a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, and they're following me, and I need to hear from you. I've been young, and now I'm old. You're old. It's okay. We'll just call it what it is. But I've never seen God forsake me, and I've never seen him leave us begging for bread. If that's your story, gray hair, can you just give me your hand? Show me your hand, you know that's your story, that God is faithful. I need to hear that, I need to hear that because you lived, you lived through the 60s. How, I mean, how tumultuous can it get? It's almost like a replay now. You lived through that. You saw the civil rights movement and all of the banter back and forth. You saw World War II, you saw Vietnam, you saw what happened, I need to hear from you, I've been young. Now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen their children begging for bread, because hope doesn't disappoint. Do you believe that? Say yes. Is that good news? Say amen. amen. Hope doesn't disappoint. Young people, you need to grab around some, some, some old people that don't look cool, <laughs> and you need to get $10 out of your pocket and pay for coffee for them, and ask them, tell me about the goodness of God. Tell me about your history with God. Tell me about what happened before I was ever born. Tell me about how God answered your prayer. Tell me how God led you to my grandma. Can you tell me that story? Because you've been young and now you're old. And I know that you know that you've never been forsaken by God and your children aren't begging for bread because hope doesn't disappoint. I dream, I dream of an intergenerational church. Y'all have something pretty special here. You have young people always on stage. I mean, I'm up here in Air Force Ones. I'm sorry, thank you, Jesus, amen. And you're still accepting me. This is rare, you need to know that you're rare. Can I just tell you that new hope? You're rare. And it, you should really celebrate what's happening right now. This is, this is a rarity, I promise you. I travel all over the country, this is rare. And I wish that the nation could see what y'all are doing here because I believe, I so long for an intergenerational church, not an out with the old, in with the new, but from the cradle to the grave, a full expression of the kingdom because this is what I think can happen. This is what I think can happen. We need old people telling us why we're doing what we're doing. We need the middle-aged people telling us what we're doing. And we need young people to tell us how we're gonna do it. That takes some humility on everyone's part because old people are fearing that they're not needed anymore and young people are fearing that they're not heard nor, nor seen anymore. But we need both, you're needed and you're heard, amen? amen? Hope doesn't disappoint. Is that my cue to get going? Yes, Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor said I had till eight o'clock. 
Sunday. Hope doesn't disappoint. Sometimes you can look at the future and hope because you can look back on a faithful God in the past. I know we started off in the beginning of the week and through the wild, and I'm talking about, but forget the past, right? And, and be able to look towards the future. But it's only sometimes when you have a reservoir of God's faithfulness to lean on and draw from that you can honestly look at a, the future with a hopeful expectation. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalms 116.7. It says, be at rest, my soul. For the Lord has been, past tense, good to you. Be a rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Be a rest, he's been good. Be a rest, he's been good. You know what the APA has actually published? The middle child syndrome as an actual psychological condition. They say it like this, the middle child syndrome is the belief that the middle children are excluded, ignored, or even outright neglected because of their birth order. This is either perceived and or reality, but it's there. The APA, the, what is it, the American Psychological Association published this, this statement. It's an actual syndrome. The middle child syndrome is the belief that the middle children are excluded, ignored, or even outright neglected because of their birth order. But there are some positives that happen in the birth order and the distinctive personality as it forms when you're a middle child. And here are some of those. They're great mediators. Middle children are great mediators. Doesn't that make sense? They're always in the middle. And they're trying to make, they're trying to be the, the in-between. I love my older sibling and my mom is super mad at them and how do I reconcile it? However, that works out, right? They're trustworthy friends and they work well as team members. And they work well as team members. They're great mediators. We need the mediator of hope in this moment. They make great Great team members sandwiched between faith and love. We need hope. We need hope. Do you believe that? First Peter, let's go to First Peter chapter 1. And Peter's writing to a persecuted church, a dispersed church. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, all praise to God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God, Jesus Christ, raised Jesus Christ, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Verse three, when he says, now we live with great expectation, other translations saying we now live with great hope because Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus, two friends are walking on a seven mile trip and they feel hopeless. Proverbs says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I wonder if sometimes we're so discouraged because we have hope deferred. They were expecting Jesus to manifest in a certain way, not to be killed. But because he was resurrected, everything changes. He conquered death, hell, sin, and the grave. What can stand against us if God be for us? But hope deferred makes the heart sick. But hope deferred makes the heart sick. We need hope. I need hope. In a world that is so 
hopeless. We have got to be the people that sound distinctively different at the water cooler. We have got to be the people next month at Thanksgiving dinner that distinctively sound different, that our tongue is laced with hope. Do we, I mean, we, got, we have got to be a people that when we go to our schools, young people, when they're telling us about all that's wrong and, and everything and your friends are dealing with depression and anxiety, it can't just be that you just, well, I'm so sorry, I'm here for you, but your confession has got to bring hope in that moment. In other, we, need, we need drug dealers that deal hope. That deal hope. That we'd be hope dealers on every street corner, in every byway, offering the hope that is Jesus. The hope that anchors us. The hope that never changes. The hope that develops us. The hope that doesn't disappoint. We need hope. We've got to sound different. I just speak the truth, brother, brother. Yeah, well, he came in truth and what? Also grace. Medicine's horrible. Give a little cotton candy with that. It's hope. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. That's hope. It's like the sugar of the spirit. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But hope deferred makes the heart sick. We stand to your feet.